Hello, Freshy Fresh episode coming at you. It's Nobody Asked Us presented by Brooks Running with Des and Kara. And our special <laughs> Olympic sponsor, Ketone IQ, which Des and I are oh. living off of here right now. Oh my I mean, gosh. You're doing them all day long. I've been doing a shot before every uh, evening session or actually 30 minutes out from when I have a call. Keeping us going. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Honestly, like one of the worst things you can do is be under fueled. And so I feel like this bridge is a gap between yeah. like bouncing around in events and like food. So it's, yes. it's helping me stay somewhat on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Quite on. Not totally on, but somewhat on. Imagine if we didn't have these. Oof, oh, it, we would off. not be here right now. We'd be a hot, hot mess. So I want to address my hair. Des asked what was up with the hair. Um, got to a a side profile. Yeah. Okay. It's just in a high bun. Got Mm -hmm. to a point last night I got in bed and, uh, could smell my hair. So when that (laughs) happened and it did not smell good, it smelled like boat rides and broadcasting compounds and runs and and adapting to the European culture. (laughs) When that happens, the hair has to get washed. It doesn't happen very often, but it's happening more often than normal here. But anyway, I just washed my hair. I feel so clean right now. And I know that fresh, in two hours, fresh, <laughs> I a, this is as fresh as it gets. The whole body is clean. So that's what's going on with the hair. Um, well, yeah. Wait, hold on. I'm going to dig into that. Like, why have you been, like, why didn't you do it last night? What were you up doing? Okay. That's a great question. So one thing I would love to share with everyone is that we are live on NBC. So everything you're seeing, if you just turn on NBC is live. However, everything gets repackaged for primetime. And so primetime was when Mike Tirico sitting there and we love him like legit. Des and I love him. Charlotte boy. He's Charlotte, he's a Charlotte boy. <laughs> he's the best. Like literally we are like, he's one of our dream guests to have on because he's just legit through and through as a real person. But that's, Different I'm going story. off on a tangent. So when we go to primetime, let's just say we're filming the intro to the men's steeplechase. They didn't make primetime. What made primetime last night? Women's 5,000. We're filming the intro to the Women's 5000. Let's say in real time, we had a minute and 45 seconds to intro everybody. In prime time, they might say, do that. We need that. We want the intro. We want all the information you said, but you have 12 seconds. So now all of that has to be revoiced to fit that 12 seconds. And by the time the show wraps live here, there's about two hours before primetime starts. So it goes in order of importance of what's going to be shown during primetime. So for instance, the only thing I was in last night that I called, the, the steeples weren't going to be in primetime, but the 5,000 was. But it was the second to last thing that was going to be shown. So the meet ends at 10 o'clock, although last night it went later because Mondo kept going for a world record. Meet ends. We are rushed to the cafeteria. We eat food. Now it's about 11 o'clock and now we're just waiting. Our producers are not sitting around. They have not eaten a bite of food. What they're doing is repackaging everything into these tiny formats and the amount of time that they're allowed to have in prime time. Then they start working through what's going to be shown in prime time. So last night it was like 200, 200 semis for the women was going first, then men's first round. And so we're waiting and they're making them the right they're making the footage the right amount that can go in there and then we start getting called into a booth to start redoing stuff in this new time frame oh, and right. so yeah this more tighter time frame and so for instance the event of the night last night was mondo well they we went to Trey and Paul at least 20 times but now it's getting condensed <laughs> down to this short 4 minute segment or 3 minute segment whatever it is on primetime so they've been talking for literally hours about mondo And now they have to get that same excitement and relay that same excitement and meaning and all of the key things they said, remember that, and then get it on this package. So it takes so long. So my my teammates have been getting back to the hotel between 2 and 4 a.m. I've been lucky because the last two nights, it was around midnight when they got to my event and they said no fixes and I got to come back. I've been getting back around midnight. My producer told me today, Women's Steeple and Men's 15 are in what's called like the feature of the night. And he's like, you will not be back till about 2 a.m. tonight. So it's not like we wrap at 10 and then we go to dinner and we go to bed. We wrap at 10, we grab a quick bite, and then we're waiting for production who's working as hard as they can to get these clips ready. And then voiceovers, and that takes three to four hours. So it's an exhausting process. And um, 
It's just not what you think. Like even me, I'm when I first joined it, I'm like, I'll call it live and mm-hmm. then I leave. And yeah. that's not at all what happens. Yeah. A, a little mini version was marathon project that I did the very first time I called a race. And I, I was like, oh, we're done. Like, see you guys later. They're like, no, no, you have to stand by. And we did a few things for the show and it like, it was ours. Like, yeah. oh, I'm not getting paid enough for this. Right, right, right. <laughs> I was, you know, it was close for the original live. Right. And then you added in the extra hours and you're like, I'm going to do the math on this. I I actually don't need to do it. I know it doesn't pencil out. <laughs> and that has been a theme with my husband being here. He's like, I cannot believe how long and how hard you're working yeah. for the pay. And that's not like I that's not like a thing I want to get into right now. But this this job you don't do it for the moolah. <laughs> it's it's lo- love of the game. It's for right? the love of the game. A hundred percent. It really truly is. So well, just yeah. Be a doll and take some of those ketones to the oh. uh, people in the production truck. <laughs> so I only have enough for like myself. So if I am able to meet up with you, I want to bring some for our research team because I was taking totally. a shot last night and they're like, what is that? What and I was like, that? I feel like an a-hole because you guys could really use. I mean, like I wake up in the morning. I woke up today at nine and I have notes for today outside my door. Like they are. Mm-hmm. I mean. The people who get new love are really like our producers, our camera crew, the people cutting the footage, repackaging it, our research team. Like at least we get to have our voices on air and we get to be like, oh, you guys did a great job, you know, (laughs) but it's hundreds of people behind us, but like 50 people specifically that are up until 4 a.m. and back at it again the next, the very next morning. So it's, it's such a grind and you know, the first couple of days I was like, oh, I'm so tired. And now I'm like just in the thick of it. And honestly, I, I know I'm going to hang in there. The two days I'm the most nervous about is that Friday night, I won't get home till 2 a.m., 5.30 pickup call for, you know, pick up for the marathon. Yeah. And same thing the next night, I won't get home until 2 a.m. And then 5.30 is my car ride over for the marathon. So the marathons are what I'm the most worried about. And they're the hardest to call. I wish you were in the call so bad because you're filling three hours of time. They're the hardest things for me to call. And that's where my dream of you and I calling would be so great because you can fill a lot of that space because you're still racing the marathon. You're so good at the marathon. Anyway, those are the two calls I am the most nervous about for the entire Olympics. So you'll, the thing about the marathon is it's, it is long. So you have more time to breathe and think and process and get texts from your friends with things you yes. want to talk about. I'm so gonna, and I will shout up. you out on air <laughs> if I use it. I will be texting you and that, that thank you. That will be super, <laughs> my podcast friend. Um, yeah, I got a hot tip from a source. (laughs) I'm dead. Deceased. I will call you out and no one else. Um, yeah, no, no. And it's a different game, right? Like you have to be so concise because even in a 1500, you need to let it breathe. Like one Mm -hmm. of the things when I first started broadcasting is I thought you had to fill every little second. And then as I went through training, they're like, no, when something that's worth pointing out happens, that's when you talk. And so everything you say has to be so concise and condensed. And that's something I've had to really work on because I'm a kind of person that'll like talk, 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 re-talk it again and and tie it up with a bow. And in Mm -hmm. broadcasting, they're like, we don't need your fucking bow. You know, Put a period on it right now. (laughs) Move on. (laughs) And so it's a totally just even different mind shift to go to marathoning where you can tie that bow, where you can have these extended conversations. So it's just, it's like a totally different job. I, yeah, I think even the we've talked about this before, but the pace, like the paces of the race are so dramatic. You're like, oh, I got to figure out my cadence and my mm-hmm. voice and how I'm going to present the sentence. And like you can pause and you can think through the note, you know, it's like it's totally different. It's weird. It is um, different. So but you'll I think it'll be good. You can hit a hard reset in the evening. <laughs> And then the thing is, like, you can warm up into it, right? Like, because yeah. it is long, you can build and get your rhythm. Well, you know me well enough to know that I am a person who needs sleep. So I'm, like, having anxiety about these two days. But <laughs> I am I am grateful for the ketones because I'm just going to be shoving them in my body on the hour, every hour, <laughs> to get through those two days. And I, I go straight from the women's marathon to the airport. Oh, this is all to say to guys, guys. There won't be a podcast no. after Friday yeah. yeah, because I have to get up at the crack of dawn on Saturday and then I have to go back to the track and then again on Sunday. So we will be, this is episode four and today's Tuesday. We can do Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then we there will be a break before we conclude 
mm-hmm. all of the events. And we're just telling you now because otherwise I will not be alive. Okay. We'll, I think we're going to do, we'll try to do like a super show of the marathons and, and the, the last, last night of our track, which, yeah. you know, then it's, it's a long show and we could talk about as long as we want to. That'll be great. Um, I'll be flying back, but we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We're well, gonna make when it you happen. get back, we'll do it when you get back. So it'll be a few days delayed, which is sad, but you'll be having an Olympic hangover. You'll be missing it and we'll give you a little, a little bit more to chew on, you know, there so that'll be, be good. Wrap up closing ceremony, all yes, the things. All the things. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to put a bow on this little segment. Kara's crew is working insanely hard. Everyone there needs ketones so they can go to the show notes, hit the link, get 30% off on their first subscription order and a free six pack. You guys can also do that, our loyal listeners. And two no shows after Friday until we do a super one um, when we're back and, and fresh. Yeah, enough. but we're, we were, we promised you guys six. We're going to deliver seven. What? Right? Because tomorrow will be. <laughs> Five, six, seven. So yeah. we're delivering seven, and then the eighth one will be a super show. Yeah. Love it. We got a <sighs> schedule. We just did that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just yeah we that. actually haven't even talked about that. So Lock that I'm glad in. that we're doing that. Okay. Let me bookmark some time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we were on a Brooks boat cruise yesterday. I just want to shout out Brooks here because it was super fun. And we, on your Insta live, we did Brooks just be say, putting us on boats. Like, Brooks, boats Brooks ladies. Us on boats. I know. Like you said on the live, like what's next? A big yacht? I don't know. I mean, Get we can here. dream big. Yeah. <laughs> but we, that was so fun. And you and I got to be together, which was awesome. But the, we, you teased a special guest that was on the boat, but we never talked about who it actually I was. I feel like I, hopefully they're in the background. So maybe you could scan the video or you could just keep listening. Yeah. <laughs> So Big the, reveal. I would say the biggest breakout star, don't you think, of this Olympic Games? Yeah. Okay. And if you don't know who it is, and I'm going to say rugby. Where have you been? You still don't know who it is. <laughs> yeah. Alana Mayer was on the boat with us yesterday. And we we tried to play it cool, I would say, a little don't bit. Don't say we. I was super cool. <laughs> okay. Des tried to play it cool. I was like, we have to get a photo with her. And she's like, dude, I'm not bothering her. And I'm like, no, we're getting this photo. So I forced the photo. So I was like lucky to bump into her the morning after their um, their medal. And I, 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 they came out of the elevator. It was four of them, like the big stars of the team. And, and I go, oh my God, I love you guys. And so I got a picture. So then yesterday when we saw her, I was like, hey, we met. And she's like, dude, I've met... <laughs> It was just yesterday. It's like, I've met everyone in Paris. I was like, I met you on Thursday. She's like, dude, I've met so many people. Yeah. But anyway, what I I wanted to bring it up because, A, I'm going to show the cool photo when we post about this. She was super cool, super nice. But one of the things that was super cool, she got up and she said, she talked about how Brooks has been supporting her long before she had 3.2 million followers on, on Instagram. And that she was the first woman in rugby to have a shoe sponsorship. And Brooks was the one that made that happen. So just like our title presenting sponsor is Brooks. And that made me super proud for us to be, I mean, you've been with Brooks forever, but it made me really proud of my new relationship with them and for them to be supporting our pod because they see women in sport. And it, I don't know, it was a cool moment for me to see her thanking Brooks like that. Yeah, she definitely recognized that they bought in early, early adopters, um, adopters. And so that, that's really awesome. And I think, I think it's cool because it shows Brooks is thinking bigger. And I know that we've always been so run focused, but there's ways to talk about the product and get exposure for the product while building up women's sport. And also like running is a part of so many activities and sports and health and wellness. So they're thinking of, I mean, not that they haven't in the past, but there's just bigger and newer ways and they're, they're getting there early. So it's awesome that they were there at the beginning and now mm-hmm. they're having that moment along with her, with her, which right, is right. Like they're not awesome. like jumping on it now. Like if she right. didn't have a shoe sponsor right now, she would be signing a huge contract. Right. But like they believed in her before, like they could see the promise in her. So that was a cool moment for me to see. And then, and then I forced her to take a picture with Des and I and with my son too. So yeah, the picture you will all love. I put my jacket on because I didn't want her to feel uncomfortable about by your giant arms, by the size of my guns. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, she'll probably be intimidated and feel bad. And 
you know, I better I put the jacket know on. That we took a thousand pictures yesterday and we were going through them, and Des is like, "Why am I so small?" <laughs> also, now I have more photos on my phone, I think, of you than Ryan or my dogs. I'm like, Woo! Okay, Ryan, move up, Ryan. <laughs> It's like, holy shit, I am small. You are small. Uh, and it shocks me. This was the first time I haven't been shocked by how small you are. I have to say, like, I'm getting, like, I'm like, <laughs> oh, like, forever. I'm like, God, she's so small. Like, when I raised you, your personality's big. It's not loud, but it's big, it's solid. You know who you are. And racing you, you know, I, I've said this before. I said it in my book. There, If there was anyone I did not want to be by with six <laughs> miles to go, it was you. And I mean, literally at the Olympic trials in 2016, I respected you so much. And at the Olympic trials in 2016, when we headed on that last lap, I literally was thinking, fuck, I would rather be with anybody else. So like you race big too. You still race big. But your physical presence is quite tiny. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That last six mile thing is hilarious because it was like the exact same thoughts in two different people's minds about one another like the last person i need chasing me right now is motherfucking carrie goucher <laughs> god damn it like this is not over until i cross the finish line which is wow. so fucking tough cheers to you you got it done right. yeah okay what so well, there's a million events to cover we're going to try to breeze through most of them and obviously focus on the women's five because i think that's where the most drama was where do you want to go first um, let's go american centric uh is mostly what this is going to be let's do field at least Let's start with discus. That's at the top of my results here. Okay. Val Allman, Stanford grad. I think she's a Colorado native. Um, maybe not. Maybe she's just friends with Elise Cranny, so I think that. <laughs> um, she won the Olympics in Tokyo. Yeah. She was expected to dominate world champs in 03 and 04. Or sorry, 02 and 03 and lost. Both of those, mm -hmm. shockingly. And she went out and just... uh annihilated everyone to defend her gold medal it was krauser-esque right she just yeah. flunked she missed her first throw was like uh, yeah. was out of bounds and so i mean whatever there's not a ton of pressure at that point it's like i feel like it's like tatis going up to bat like he, san diego padre he goes up there and just takes a big crack at the first pitch like doesn't matter it's like i'm gonna swing for the fences okay now i can get like more conservative or play it safer with the rest of my pitches um, at least that's how he has been in the past. Anyhow, she, that's kind of what it looked like. Like, I'm just going to see what I can do here, like bust some nerves, try to go big, and then came back after that and, and put one out there that was like, okay, come and get me. Good luck. Well, you just said that perfectly because I have the luxury of hearing Trey. And he, what he always says about her is she goes for it on that first one because she likes to just – have that out there and have everyone else have the pressure of chasing that for the rest of the competition. And so that's exactly what happened. But obviously if you don't know Val Allman, I don't know what you're doing because she's like <laughs> super expressive and she yeah. loves it and she dances around. She's a former dancer and she just is like having the time of her life out there always. It's really, it's really fun. Total entertainer. Like you could tell the whole time, like it's about the throw, of course, but she's like, she is aware of the crowd and the moment. Yes. And, you know, I keep saying the moment, but that's, this is the place for that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I was sitting very close, so it was cool to watch and a lot of support for her. There's a lot of American supporters here. I would love yeah. to know how many like people in the state, like what percentage it is, but it, it was loud for Val. Yeah. She crushed it. We could go on and on, but we're going to leave it there because we got more stuff. So yeah. good job, yeah. Val. You absolutely destroyed. Bravo. Um, men's steeple? Men's steeple was good. Um, all the favorites got through. There was there was a little debobble. Yeah, that's what I was um, going to say. Oh, God. Was it, is it Sesa? I can't remember. Our, uh, oh God, I'm fried. I'm fried. I need to look at the results really quick to get my names right. Please forgive me here. It's the Kenyan man, right? Um, yeah, the Kenyan man was 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 pushed. Oh, they were he headed towards the water barrier on the second to last lap. And Arce from Spain, you know, he was crowded too, but he threw his arm out and hit the Kenyan. And the Kenyan had either hit the barrier at full speed or run outside the track. So onto the inside, but outside of the lane of play mm -hmm. where, where there were 30 cameramen mm -hmm. holding cameras up and he chose that route, missed the water barrier, went back around, 
jumped over the water barrier, landed in the deepest part, right? Like up to his knees with the water and then took off. His last lap was incredible. I mean, he never relented. So he was trying to get himself in the top six. Only the top six went through to the next, went through to the final. No, I'm sorry. Top five. God, top five. It's okay. It's yesterday's news. So yeah. Okay. So top five got through and he was running so hard, closing the gap, closing the gap, but ended up in sixth. And we were pretty sure that he would protest that because it was a clear infringement. And mm-hmm. um, what an effort out of him. And I was so sad for him. But thank goodness that they did protest. And now we'll see 16 men in the steeplechase final because they advanced him to the final. He Could handled you- that all so well. I didn't, it was like the exact opposite end of me, but you could okay. like, we watched it on the camera right away. You're like, oh, something has gone awry there. Um, yeah, he handled it so well, like to come back on the track and then clear the barrier, like, you know, for a protest and making sure you're not a DQ or whatever. It's like, I don't know all the little things you have to do, but those are things that you probably should do to have a fighting chance. Like if you're in a protest and you missed a barrier, I don't know. I don't know how that goes. Like, well, you didn't run the same event as everyone else. Right. You know? like, right. He probably would have finished in the top. Cause he, I mean, he closed that last up so fast. If he, if yeah, he hadn't, if he gone, hadn't around, gone back. Yeah. Like top three or whatever. Right. Um, then he might've faced a DQ for not right. going over exactly. the barrier. So he, he managed it super well, which is says a lot about where he's at mentally and physically the way he closed that down was like, everyone was, you know, running in peanut butter and he was on a track. It was was two different things going on. It was totally insane. So it was, it was serum just so we know, but, Mm -hmm. um, I will say so much pressure on the Kenyan athletes because they own that event for so many years. And Sufyan El Bacale from Morocco ended that reign in Tokyo. And so there has been so much pressure from them, from their Federation to get that back. So when he finished and he wasn't moved on to the final, it wasn't even just like disappointment for him. You could see he was like, oh my gosh. Yeah, devastation for like multiple levels. So right move to move him on one more body in the final, like he deserves to be there. Corrigan was in that heat. James Corrigan out of BYU. I mean, honestly, what a season. Okay. So in my research, getting ready for this. He set a personal best in every single <laughs> meet he ran this year. Seven personal bests. Do you know what his PR was at the beginning of the season? No, 852. <laughs> 852. Yeah. The Olympic standard is 815. There's wow. no way he ever dr- dreamed he was going to be in the Olympic Games. And he's the only man that actually ran under the Olympic standard. He ran 813.87. Let's see. This is my research from last night coming out. seconds under the Olympic standard. So I just was like stoked for him to be here. And um, I I thought it would be a long shot for him to make the final, but the, but the experience of taking this in and the confidence going back to the NCAA now, because he's only, he just finished his sophomore season. It's crazy. So now he's like, Hey guys, I was an 852 guy last year. Now I'm an 813 guy and an Olympian. Bonjour bitches. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, he and he ran savvy, right? Like, he just yeah. looked like he was tired. It looked like it had been a long season. But he made, like, the moves that were going to give him a chance. He sat back, and as things started breaking open, he was, like, covering moves, covering moves, putting himself in position. Yeah. And then it was like, well, that's just taken too much out of me, and that's yep. that's just the fatigue of a season. I totally agree. I thought so. he ran it as well as he could. He just looked fatigued from a long collegiate season, which and chasing the standard and all that stuff. But good for him. What yeah, a year. That was an exciting year to watch. Super. Okay, Heat 2 had met Wilkinson from Minnesota. He charged hard. I thought he was making the right moves as well. Like, I don't, I mean. That heat was super hot from the gun. They were running like eight, uh, mm-hmm. 805 pace. So I liked his position. He hung mm-hmm. back off of it. Like, that's too much. I'm not going to go do that. Um and then he moved late, and it was almost like he just ran out of room a little bit. He was so close to his PR, and I and I got this stat from our research team. I wasn't able to say it on air because we ran out of time, but he ran 816.82, which is just a hair off his personal best, and that was the finest in Olympic Games history to not make the final. Yeah, I believe that. In the qualifying I mean, round. He... The thing I was interested in, he closed a big gap in the middle, and like he was on the front kind of being an aggressor, and 
there was a lot of guys sitting on him and he almost just towed them he into did. position to go, which is such a bummer, but he, he never gave up. I mean, he closed it out really well. And that's, a, that is a stat. That's a great run for him and a, a bright future ahead. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, this is a guy that like until the LA meet earlier this year in May or June, whenever it was like, had never even like dreamt that big. And then was like, Oh my God, I could like go to the Olympics, you oh. know, <laughs> <laughs> get second at the U S Olympic trials. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, what a that experience was experience in general. Him. Like this is a pretty. It just seems like a this is a young and experienced young team. group. Yeah, and so it's it is about experience for the future for the the steeple men. I mean, mm-hmm. Evan Yeager was kind of the figure for so long. Yep, and we're changing of the guard here. I mean, there's a world championship next year, so I think about people yeah. like Wilkinson and Corrigan. Like this will help them so much as right. they move forward to next year and. I, I think they have nothing to hang their head on. It's just a tough event, and they yeah. they both ran really well. Third guy who doesn't have to wait. Yep. Go for it. Kenneth Rooks. Kenneth Rooks, man. Kenneth Rooks. Kenneth Rooks. The BYU man. Another BYU guy. I, Kenneth Rooks is so impressive to me. I don't know if you guys will remember, but he fell at USA's last year in mm-hmm. 2023 hard came back to outkick everyone down the final home stretch and was just like what's happening goes to the world <laughs> championships in budapest zero international experience that the usa's was his first time running a usa meet wow. zero experience makes the final in budapest so i liked the way he ran he ran with confidence he ran like he belonged to be there he never like ran any more than he needed to he was on the outside a little bit protecting his position but I thought he ran really, really well. His ca- coach at Stone was telling me before the trials, he is an engineering major and he's like, he's your typical engineer. He literally thinks about <laughs> every little thing that can happen and solves it so that when it happens in the race, he solves it. So I think it's a tall, tall order to medal this year, but I think he's someone to really watch. I think he's going to keep clawing his way up. I, th- I, I thought he looked great. Yeah. I mean, I guess if I were to sum it up, my feelings, it was like he ran like he belonged. Yeah. Ran like perfect. he belonged. Perfect analogy or so perfect fun, words. And, and made the final, so it'll be great to watch him have another crack at it. Yep. All right. Onward. Okay. I do want to just quick hit that the first round of the women's 1500 was this morning and every American got through. Super smooth. And no we'll problems. obviously get into it, but both both of the drama, drama <laughs> women from last night also got through. They're known as the drama women now. The drama the, yeah, we'll get into that. Um, no hate, just saying that was a no, lot of drama. It was dramatic. I yeah. fully agree. Okay. I think, yeah, we'll get into that later. Okay. What else? Women's eight or men's pole vault? Let's go. Let's go women's eight. I mean, this is so easy because it's like pretty much to form. Mm-hmm. I felt like there was one metal spot open that you were like someone's got a shot that we're not even talking about right now um but Hodgkinson looked like a pro's pro it was interesting walking out with Sonia and Otto afterwards walking down to the compound because they were like she could have probably led more but I was like you know what she needed to check that box she's been silver three times right silver Mm -hmm. at Olympics silver at the last two worlds and I've loved the way she ran she was she was in front, but she was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put I'm not gonna like risk my finish. Mm-hmm. And she just kept getting a tiny bit faster each hundred, just a tiny bit, just a tiny bit. And what I really appreciated was the emotion when she finished. She wasn't running around like I did it. She was like holding back tears, like getting choked up. And I yeah. felt like like there she needed to check that box for herself. And maybe in the future at a championship, she can take a risk and try to break a record. But she, I really liked the way she ran that. It was like, I know I can win this. I don't have to do anything fancy. I just need to be smart and get this done. Yeah, it was clinical, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and you're right. The emotion afterward is like, oh, thank God. Monkey off the back. Like, I had, like, it was relief as much as it was joy and happiness. It's like, oh, finally. Yes. the opportunities are rare, obviously. <laughs> I appreciated her comments in the call in the press conference afterwards because I was still awake waiting to be released. And she was talking about how the semi was yesterday. So with this repassage, in the past, it'd be prelim, very next day semi, day of rest, and then final. 
But with the repechage, it's four races in a row and it goes prelim, repechage. So she had only a rest day between the prelim and the semi. Mm-hmm. So she was talking about how since the semi yeah. was at night, you take all this caffeine to be ready, right? We've been there. You take all this caffeine, you hype yourself. And then she gets back to the hotel and it's 3 a.m. and she's just like, I'm hype. <laughs> wide awake. Wide awake. Yeah, it, it worked. Final in you know, less than 24 hours. And I thought that was really cool that she talked about that and gave a little insight into, you know, I think people think you run it and then you go to sleep and you're so rested. You wake up, you're like, today is the day of the Olympic final, you know, it's like yeah. noon. And she's like, I slept three hours and now I got to go do it again and do it better. Right. That level of fatigue is crazy. And like you put in the emotional fatigue, there's yes. physical, like all of it, you know, compounding. That's a big ask to come back, back to back and be like, okay, the pressure of the final is on now. I know you yeah. didn't have that day in between. So that's interesting that it's different. I mean, and she clearly didn't have any problems figuring out, but it's like, just relax, you know, try yeah. and relax, which it's is not an easy though. thing to do. No. And I, I've been really impressed with Juliet Whitaker. We just like her. Her mom came to our Brooks thing, uh, pontoon <laughs> boat recording. Her mom's super cool. Obviously yeah. your sister Bella is in the relay pool for the four by 400 here, but what a season out of her just finished her sophomore year. I, I think she's only 20 years old at Stanford. Yeah. She had, she had never broken like 159, I think before the trials or something. She ran 157 in the semis, 158 last night, ended up seventh at the Olympic games. I can't wait to see what she does in the next few years. I think she's going to be super, super good. And I think her Stanford teammate, Roshin Willis mm-hmm. is going to be super, super good too. I think they're going to yeah. help each other really level up and themselves to, to push each other. Yeah. Um, question about Mary Mora. Mm-hmm. Is she, how do you feel about that? How does she feel about that medal? Right? Like, does she want silver? Like, do you, are you kicking yourself for going for gold, but getting bronze is, I mean, podium, if she's in fourth, it's a whole different equation, but is she happy with that? I mean, she's had kind of an up and down season for me following it. You know, I don't call it, so I don't follow it quite as closely, but she's been hot and cold. And I I think, you know, she likes to front run. She likes to push. She wasn't necessarily in the front, but she was right yeah. on Hodgkinson's shoulders. I thought that was a good race for her. I mean, look, listen, she's she's been a medalist that I don't even know. Like, I think she was fourth in Tokyo and then she was bronze in, was she bronze in oh, two? And then she won last year. I mean, she's extremely consistent. So I think, of course, she would have rather have had silver, but I kind of like her moxie that she went out there and, and was like, I can run with you. I beat, I beat you last year, like jumping across the finish yeah. line at the world championships. What do you think? She was third in Eugene, one Budapest. Um, I'm pretty sure she was fourth in Tokyo. So like she's run, she's Aside, take out Hodgkinson. She's the most consistent, right? Like Mo isn't here. So Hodgkinson's been was second three years in a row, I think. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, she's the most it's consistent. It's semifinals in uh, Tokyo. Oh, okay. Which is crazy. And I'm so, remembering I mean, that wrong. But yeah, it, this could just. No, no, I'm sure that's right. Wrong. So she, now but, she has two bronze and a, and a gold. At that level. I mean, global I think that's the, the level of risk you have to take, right? You can't yeah. be thinking about, like, well, I hope I get silver. Like, you know, I think she would, trying to win it if she finished fifth, she's still making that choice. Like, I'm, I was trying to win. Yeah. And she knows so. that Hodgkinson is on, is at the top of her game, right? She has the world leading time. She broke the British record. She, people forget she ran faster than a thing Mo has ever run. Right. Leading up to this. So I think she knew she was the favorite and she's like, I, if I'm going to beat her, I got to be with her. I can't, right. I can't like let her get a lead or, and I also don't want to drag her either. I right. thought she ran well. I'm sure she would have preferred silver or gold, but I don't yeah, know. And I guess it's a good point. Like this isn't like an asterisk win. Like, oh, right. well, Mo was no. in there. Like Mm-mm. that, that's not it. They all ran and are having an amazing season. So yes. it would have been interesting to have Mo in there, but it's not like hand her the gold. No. And and we all love a thing, Mo, but she hasn't shown that kind of form at all, even in the rounds at the trials that she did run. Right. Um, Dugma from Ethiopia, third. She was a surprise winner at the Indoor World Champs, so it was cool to see her back that up. But that's right. if I'm Nikki Hiltz or Emily Mackay, I'm liking seeing her medal here, it's showing that the indoor does translate to outdoors. So. Good yeah. race. I was yeah, just sure. very happy for Hodgkinson after all those silvers to 
Yeah. To get the win. So when you're, you don't want to root for it, but you're kind of rooting for it. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, should we do pole vault? Let's do Mondo. I mean, Sam Kendricks was great. Remember when Sam Kendricks almost didn't go to the Olympics? Yeah, he looked like yeah. he was happy he went last night. Yeah, I think he was having some fun. I think he, he did look great. Fun. He looked great. He, you know, I don't follow him as well as Paul and Trey do, but they were saying this is the best he's looked in years. He looked confident. He was clean over the bar. He looked awesome. And he had a, he, sh- you know, it's one of those situations where it's like when you were racing Bolt or racing Kip mm-hmm. Yegon the last few years, it's like, you're you're running the best you've ever you're competing the best you've ever competed, but you're literally competing against what will go down as the greatest. Time. You know, anyone yeah. competing against Simone Biles. It's like you know. Your second is <laughs> a lot of other people's wins. It would win any other time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it it won't because you got Mondo in there. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it was cool to see him. He was hyped, dude. Like, yeah, he would clear a bar and just be ecstatic, and rightfully so. He was having a good day, so that was fun to watch. Well, a guy we didn't get to see all that many attempts from was Mondo because he doesn't really need to bother with a lot of the lower heights. Um, yeah, I mean, he won the Olympic gold medal on a hundred percent clean competition, no misses. Yeah, his only misses came after the competition was over. He won, and when he started going for the world record, I mean. It's, you know, Paul and Trey get frustrated because they want people to understand what that means. You know, like everyone has a miss. That's how it works. Val Allman had a miss. Mondo, no misses. And he didn't even start the competition until, you know, he had like an (laughs) hour, over an hour, I think they said, for his entry height to when he jumped again and completely, completely clean competition. Yeah. And like, He's in position to win. It's like, well, what do you do next? And the obvious thing is you chase records. Now, there's Olympic record and world record. You have to start with the Olympic. I mean, there's got to be bonuses for all this, right? So you're going, I'm I'm doing the Olympic record. Got that. Check. Easy. And like, (laughs) you're watching him go over and you see how much he's clearing it by. Like, not even a doink in sight (laughs) not even a doink in sight there's going to be a long time no Um, doinks yeah that's we can have a conversation about that but we won't um (laughs) so yeah i mean he was he's had so much space and then then they set it up to world record height were you still there oh yeah we were there up in the booth oh yeah we don't leave the booth until meet ends. And even then we don't leave the booth. Um, we don't leave the booth till we're told to go down to the compound. So we were there and yeah, he took his first attempt and it didn't look good. Like it didn't look how he'd been jumping all night was a miss. Second one was a little better, but still sloppy. And again, I have the luxury of hearing Trey break it all down. Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm this pole vault expert. And they were saying he didn't run from far enough. And then he was going to back, back up, back up the runway and give himself more running time. And Both times when he missed it, you could hear, ah, you know, I mean, no one left the stadium. No. Everyone was sane. They were going to see if this world record happened. And then on that third one, he got over. I actually videotaped it like a little kid and uh, it was loud in there. Loud, loud, loud. Everyone, I mean, everyone was going to wait. And that was a really cool thing for field events and pole vault in particular. I mean, he was the star of the show. All the mm-hmm. events were done. They did the 100 meter men's medal ceremony. Those guys got all the love. And then it was like, okay, this is the Mondo show. I don't think anybody left. Um, and they were just like pumping music. They were doing karaoke. They had a bunch of uh, songs that were playing after the men's 10,000 that I'm going to I'm gonna have the tune in my head for the rest of my life. My life. They, they do it fast. And then they slow yes, down. Yes, yes. And they're like, how many iterations are there? And it was enough to fill the time between Mondo's attempts. Um, he had a thing afterwards where he said his mom gave him some advice about his yeah, run, his approach. That's awesome. Um, he was like, yeah, you know, my mom, every now and then she'll step in with like some real winner advice. I listened to her and went out there and, and got it done. And dude, there's still room. Like he's going to slowly oh, yeah. chip away at this. 
Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many times he set the world record now, but what I thought was funny too was like he made his, I can't remember if his first or second attempt that he didn't make. And then he sat down and they did the hunt and they did the hundred, um, you know, award ceremonies. Yeah. And then he went back to try again. Like, I mean, like literally everyone's just waiting on him, but he has a certain amount of time per rules between jumps that he can take. Um, but I just wanted to, because there have been some people that ask, like, why is he, he's not even Swedish, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, he is. His mom is <laughs> Swedish. His dad's American. Yes, he grew up in Louisiana and he started vaulting as a kid, had dual citizenship as a young child. And as he went through the professional, as he got older, got to decide who he competed for, decided to compete for Sweden because he knew that it was the right choice. He would be a much bigger star there than in America. In America, we don't appreciate the field events. He is a mega star. Like we are like, mm -hmm. oh, he has a deal with Puma. He has a bazillion <laughs> other deals in Sweden. Yeah. The right choice for him. And, you know, it reminds me of Sonia Richards Ross, who moved to the United States when she was 12, dual citizen of Jamaica and the United States. She decided to run for the United States because she felt like she could make more money that way. Right choice for her. But anyway, he is a dual citizen, has been his whole life. So anyone hating on him, get over yourself. This isn't yeah. like it is a last minute decision so he could make another country's team. He's the best that's ever done it. <laughs> yeah, he can <laughs> make any team he, he wants to. He wants, yeah. 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 I mean, I think there's probably more to that too. Not like not to just chalk it up to money, but it's like yeah, yeah. representation. How can you grow the sport? What can you 100%. do the most for? And like also just pride for who you want to wear on your chest, like what feels right. So let's be real. America's had the world record holder in the pole vault before Mondo and the Olympic champion in the pole vault multiple times before mm -hmm. Mondo. And they are not household names. Right. So it was the right decision to help grow that discipline and to get people talking about it and paying attention and a stadium staying to wait and watch him jump. So good for him. Good decision. And he's a great athlete to watch. And pro probably more world records to come. Yeah. You never know. I mean, at this point, it's like what I what's motivating him and, and that's that's gotta be hard for him, you know? Like when you set a world record every single year. I mean, he set a world right. record, I think, at pre last year. So it's like, you know, that is impressive to me how you're finding the motivation to keep coming and trying to better it and keep putting it further and further out of reach because like he's already won everything you could possibly win. Yeah. He's competing against himself. Yeah. And the discipline. Like, how yeah. do I make the discipline better and how do I push the, the boundary on it? But totally. The competition was not the same. <laughs> no, no. And that's not that's not a like shot at Sam, Ken Sam Kendricks at all. It's just it is what it is, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Drum roll. The 5,000. Woo. Okay, it happened. Be before we get to the drama, I just want to say, I don't know when again we'll see a loaded field of women <laughs> who are at their prime. And I was trying to get this across on NBC. I don't know if I did it or not, but we have Safan Hassan, the reigning Olympic champion, silver medalist last year in this event, one of the greatest runners of all time across multiple events, but we're, right. I'm just trying to focus on the 5,000, one of the best to ever do it. Then there's Faith Kip Yegon, who took to the 5,000 last year. I was like, oh, why not? I'll try that. Broke the world record in her first 5,000 in years. I think it was 1407 at the time. <laughs> then goes and wins the world championship, right? So she's in there. Then Gudoff's a guy who won the world championship in 2022. Olympic bronze medalist from 2021 uh, is the world record holder. Broke the world record at Prefontaine last year, running 14 flat. Good luck wrapping your head around that. <laughs> and then Beatrice Chabet, who was second to Gudoff's guy at that Prefontaine race, I think running 1405, second fastest woman ever, but who we saw earlier this year at Prefontaine run 28.54, I think. And if you do the math and the conversions, that says she can run under 14 minutes in the 5,000 meters. So right. for me, it's all these women are good at other events too. Obviously, we're seeing Hassan again in the 10,000 in the marathon. We're seeing Sagai again. She ran the 15 today. Kip Yegon ran the 15 again today. We're seeing Shabet again in the 10. But all these women meeting at the height of their careers, it's hard to describe. Like It's like if if... I can't, I can't do it justice. Like Mondo was racing, was pole vaulting against three other Mondos at the same time. Right. It just doesn't happen. Right. 
So that like the race itself, I was just like for an American to meddle in this <laughs> is going to be so, so hard. And it doesn't take away from their performances or how they run, but they're literally like we were talking about how hard it would be to pull out against Mondo. Pff, try four of them. Right. In your event. Right. Go get it. Yeah. Four Sydney's. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Better. Like great analogy. Perfect. So the race itself, I was like, this is going to be an absolute firecracker. So what did you think when it went out? Like, what were you, ex- what were you expecting? What were you thinking? I was thinking, Hassan, will go to the back. All the other big three will kind of stay together and watch each other. They all have good finishes, but no one is going to lead this early on. And their first lap was like 76 or something like that. Yeah. And I was like, someone is going to be, someone's going to go. I thought it might be cranny, but I was like, someone's going to say, I'm not, I can't run 14 yeah. flat. <laughs> so I'm going to take it now because I'm at least going to shake them up a little bit. And it ended up being grooved off uh, from Norway. And she's, you know, in her mid thirties, this is her fourth Olympic games. She's run like 1430. And she was like, damn, you guys. She's a grinder. <laughs> she is she's, a grinder. She's done that in the past. And I think, you know, she led a ton of folks to, I think it was Oslo and in, in the pouring rain. And she was like, no, I'm here to race. And went to the front and pushed it. I don't think she won, but she like set her national record that way. So she was yeah. just like, I, I can't wait around. And right. also like, who's the most dangerous if Gro- Grovedal doesn't take it? Kipigon? Like when does Chibet start going like, well, I'm the 10,000 meter or Hassan, like I'm sort of in marathon training. Right. How long can I wait? I was a little surprised, but I guess it's, it's always tactical. So. I mean, it's kind of funny. You can like script it. Like we knew Hassan was going to go in last place. Right. (laughs) Like it's just, it's going to happen. We know Sagai is going to stay like on the outside and then work with her teammate eventually to try to string it out a little bit because Sagai now I'll say Sagai doesn't have a kick, but she did win world champs last year in the 10,000 in a kick against Hassan. Now that's controversial because Hassan fell. My opinion on it, watching it back was Hassan. This is, we're going back to Budapest, 2023, 10,000. They're coming down the home stretch. Hassan is in front. Uh, Sagai is closing on her. Sagai's in lane three because Hassan is, is moving out. She came off the turn in lane one, but now she's moving out, moving out. She's, she's getting caught. She knows that you're allowed to move out. Mm-hmm. But she's moving out and she moves out so much that she makes contact with Sagai. Sagai kind of fights back. Hassan falls. When I watched that, I did not see that Sagai caused Hassan's fall. Hassan believed that she was wronged. Sagai was not disqualified. Um, my whole point in telling this story is that I've always felt like Sagai has to take it for a long time and has to like take the sting out of everyone. But last year she kind of proved me wrong because she won the 10,000 in a kick. But I still thought at some point she'll get antsy and she'll start grinding it because she doesn't have the kind of kick that Hassan has when Hassan is on or Chibet or Kip Yegon. I mean, Kip, Kip Yegon also doesn't have a 200 meter kick. Yeah. Kip Yegon has a 400 meter grind fest, right? And so anyway, I just kind of started it. It it developed the way I thought it would develop minus the massive freaking drama. I could not believe how long that lasted. Could you see it from where you were? <laughs> um, no, no. I like I saw the DQ afterwards and I'm like, okay. I don't even know what this is about. Um, I'm going to send you a photo of oh, I did send you a photo of like where the seats were. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think the sun was mostly down by that point, but it like the lights were really bright. I wore I wore my sunglasses for most of the evening. Yeah, um, that's wild. Bit of like, <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah, across the track, like it was hard to see what was going on. So you'd look up at the screen. Um, but so yeah. we caught it and we reshowed it, and what it looked like to me in the moment, and, and we showed it just once. We replayed it just once because the race was happening. Was that Sagai went to move to the front, and she cut in where she didn't have room. She didn't have a clear step on. Kippy mm-hmm. You have to and have a full stride length, right? That's the rule, right? The rule is full stride length. She definitely didn't have that. So she came in, which, you know, this stuff happens. Doesn't right. mean the guy's a bad person. She's not this being stuff. dirty because she's trying to find her space. Thank you. She's trying to find her space. Exactly. But Kippy was like, yeah, yeah, no. Uh-uh. You don't have this space. Is my space. <laughs> so a lot of times you protect your position by just putting your arm out. 
I didn't think that Faith nothing there Kip Yegon did anything wrong. She did kind of push her arm under Sagai's and push it. Sagai then looks over <laughs> and pushes her back. And Kip Yegon is like, what the heck? Like puts her arms up and almost steps off onto the inside of the track. And then Sagai slides in. So when I was and, and then they're both they're both like Pissed. chattering at each other. <laughs> yeah. And even Chibet's like, guys, calm down. You know, like anyway. I couldn't believe how long it went. Like once Kip Yegon put her arm up, Sagai should have stayed on the outside of lane one and just gotten another stride and then cut in. And it, mm-hmm. it was like dramatic, like, rah, 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 like a little bit of cat fighting, honestly. Yeah. But, but you know, nobody fell. I don't think it, it didn't affect anyone's race. It well, wasn't was it. the kicking was happening. It wasn't right. in a part of the race that was in, so crucial. Like it was pretty early, right? What laps were you? It was probably in the last third. Okay. So it, was, it wasn't It was like in the first two laps, but it was with like three to go. You know what I mean? Like there was right. like, it did well, not affect the outcome of the race in my opinion. Right. And that's like that's when the racing starts where you're looking for position and you're trying to hold your spots and that stuff starts to matter. Yep. And it can impact it, but like nobody tripped, nobody, you know, right. Had it happened on the straightaway or in the last lap, maybe I'd feel differently, but it didn't. And everyone fell into form and we're over it. It doesn't even cross my mind again. So then the kicking starts and Hassan starts moving up like she does. So guy is out the back. I'm like, what the heck is going what on? Happened there, right? Yeah. But I'm like, okay, whatever. And I had told NBC, Beatrice Chibet might steal this show. I think she's like a star in the making, but we don't have a ton of stuff on her because she hasn't won anything yet. I mean, she's won World Cross, but nothing on the track. Anyway, Hassan is moving, but, but Kip Yegon is doing what she does best, which is for 450 meters, I'm going to be in an all out sprint. Mm-hmm. And so you have to come now. <laughs> and you can't wait till the last 100, right? right? That's what she does best. But Tibet, so, you know, Hassan is is kind of coming, kind of coming, but she's waiting for her last 150. And by that point, Kip Yegon's gone. Tibet goes with her and Tibet looked so easy, Des. I mean, you were there. Yeah. It was like, she was like, and uh, honestly, they came on, uh, they came to the the final turn onto the home stretch. And it was almost like, she was like, should I pass her? Right. Am I allowed to? Like she's <laughs> such an icon, not right. just in Kenya. I mean, huge icon in Kenya, but globally. Right. Right. And, and it was almost like, she was like, should I, can I, okay, I'm just going to do it. And, yeah. And she wins. Yeah. It was dramatic across the board. And of course, you know, Hassan's closing like a freight train. Yep. I mean, it was pretty clear who was going to be on the podium. Yes. Um, but it, that close was still really aggressive, which I thought was interesting to see. It was interesting to see her medal in that distance. Like, I was is surprised. she gonna is she gonna compromise as it goes higher in in distance, or is she is she gonna medal in them all? Because I wasn't sure. Like, if you're really focused on the marathon, I want like I, I'm thinking she's not in contention late or doesn't have that kick or goes with the front early because she's not going to wait that long. But I was surprised to see her medal in that because we saw her race earlier this year. You know, she barely outkicked Elise Cranny. You know, marathon training is so different than 5,000 meter training. Some of her quotes afterward were like, I'm crazy. I just wanted to, and she used the word crazy, not me. (laughs) I just wanted to see what I could do. I'm, I'm surprised I won a medal. It's, the marathon is going to be so interesting to me because that marathon is so course specific. So I was shocked to see her medal. I will admit, I thought it was going to be Sagai, Kipiegon, Chibet, not in that order, but I thought it was going to be those three women. And I thought Hassan would be left out because of the difficulty and the specificity. Yes. That it would take for that marathon. So I was surprised by that, but she gets, she got in and the Americans finished. 10th for Carissa Schweitzer, 11th for Elise Cranny, 14th for Whitney Morgan. I just want to tip my hat a little bit to Elise Cranny. Thank you. <laughs> because, you know, she was in that race. She knows what's on the line. She knows who she's racing. She's She she knows what she's up against. And I didn't talk to her, but it seemed to me she said, I either go with it or I just run in the back and I kick my way into eighth or ninth. Right. You know, I but what I want is I want an Olympic medal. And she put herself in it 
And yeah, she faded badly over that final lap, but it's only because she was a factor the whole way until mm-hmm. the last lap. Yep. And I was like, I was just very impressed by that. I just thought like, that's how you win a medal. And it didn't happen this time, but it will. I thought she took great chances, made smart decisions in like, yeah, like whatever. If you're fourth or 11th, it's all the same. Right, right. You yeah. Know? And she was like, I'm going to risk it all. And I want to try and have the breakthrough day here at the biggest Stage event possible. in this sport. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I thought it was really brave, gutsy racing. And I think, um, man, she was in it a long time. You're right. Yeah, she was. She was. So good for her. And awesome to see three Americans in that final. So the whole DQ <laughs> goes down. Do we even get into this? We There's no to. victory lap. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, <laughs> I saw that Schweizer was the first American in 10th. And then I'm looking at the results and I'm like, what? She's in ninth. And I'm she, like, where'd I'm she like, go? Yeah. I was just, well, I didn't even realize that Kip Yegan okay. was out. I was just yeah. like, wait, Schweizer got ninth. I'm like, wow, I'm tired because I swear <laughs> she was 10th. <tenth." laughs> and then all of a sudden my producer's in my ear and he's like, Keep your guns out. Keep your guns out. You know, and he and we're showing other stuff. So people are tweeting at me. How can you not be talking about the DQ, guys? We have to go where the action is. The 800 is starting. Okay, we're not going <laughs> to not show the freaking women's 800 because Faith Kip Yegan got DQ'd. We eventually go back. So he shows it to me, and I say, I don't see a DQ here. I'm not it. I'm not a judge, right. rules expert, right? But for me, this is Ethiopian Federation filed a protest. The the committee took it, and I'm if, if I'm the Kenyan Federation, I am appealing this decision because there is impediment by both athletes, mm-hmm. not and and actually the initial contact, the initiation of the contact was by Sagai. Right, that's and very yeah. important. <laughs> so so you know we do we do get through it, and then we we get through the 800, and then we do hop on there and and say that. But you know we don't have any information. We don't even know if Kenya has appealed. The mm-hmm. decision, but so you got to go back and watch it. What were your thoughts going back and watching that? I mean, I had seen the text thread from our crew, so I feel like I was pointed in a certain direction. But if you watch it, and you the the beauty of the iPhone, where I'm watching everything after these races, is that you can hold it down and basically go frame by frame. Like she drifts from the outside of lane one. And comes right across and the contact happens in the middle of it. And then she just creates her own. It's not there. Like she made it by getting aggressive and you got to have the space. Like I think, you know, Kippy again was a little high with it. Like Mm -hmm. generally it's like you can put your hand on someone's hip. Or like holding out. Yeah. Yeah. But I think she was going to go there no matter what. So even if it's like on her back and like, okay, now she's in front of me, but I've lost my spot. And right. That's not what she wanted to do, which she guarded her space is what I thought. And I thought it was totally acceptable. Yeah. But I think you made a really good point in that it was initiated by Sagai. Yeah. So. So seems- then we're showing Batacletti of Italy being told she's the bronze medalist. And they're showing it to me live on air. They don't tell me they're going to show this. Jeez. And they're like, she's now the bronze medalist. And I'm like live on air. And I'm like, I don't think she will be, though. Hold the phone. Let's not do this. It's nothing against her. She ran freaking amazing. She put herself in it. She kicked like everyone else. She set a national record. But I don't I don't think that's gonna hold up. And like I felt so bad for her. I mean, what a roller coaster ride. You finish fourth, you set a national record, you're fourth, you're disappointed, you're fourth, but also you're like, that was the best race of my life. Then all of a sudden it changes to like best race of my life and an Olympic medal. And then they're like, uh an hour and 45 minutes later. Just kidding. Yeah. That sucks. That's, that's a roller coaster. Honestly, like I didn't even see the DQ come up. I obviously didn't see the bump or any of the replays and she was running down the back stretch with the flag. And I'm like, Oh, it's like a, or I don't think she had a flag, but she was doing a little bit of like a, a victory celebration type thing. I was like, is this like a top European thing? Oh my gosh. Like we've so seen like French people, you know, right. kind of have a yeah. moment. I'm like, but she's Italian. Like maybe it's a European right. thing or maybe her like, I don't know. I just, and then, and then I saw the DQ and I was like, oh, that's, this is awkward. Mm-hmm. Pretty awkward. So I get down to the compound and I'm like, has the Kenyan Federation appealed? 
And they're like, we don't know, but Kenya typically doesn't do stuff like that. I'm like, well, I'll what? do it for her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is like a, like, this is crazy to me. And so it was, it was about an hour and 45 minutes before they reinstated Kippy Agon, but she didn't do a victory lap or she had started and then she left it. She left in tears. She avoided right. the media and left in right. tears, missed all that moment of getting a medal the thing that I'm left with, which is leaving a bad taste in my mouth, I got to say, is that she is left with a yellow card for the rest of the meet. So we saw Ellie St. Pierre got one of these at the Olympic trials. Shakari Richardson got one for stepping on the line. Um, it basically means for the rest of the meet, if she initiates contact with anyone in any round of the 1500, she's out. DQ, automatic DQ. This is really? for Kip Yegon. Right. And it's leaving a bad taste in my mouth because if you're going to give her a yellow card, then I feel like the guy, the guy should have a yellow card. Right. Absolutely. You know, yeah. And the referee said, we don't like this type of behavior. Okay. What behavior? <laughs> there were two women going right. back and forth. Like maybe I, you don't like the way Kip Yegon reacted. Okay. That's fair. She didn't actually start it and she got, she gave it and got it back. You know what I mean? Right. Like she got it, pushed back and then got it back again. So that's leaving a bad taste in my mouth that Sagai doesn't have any sort of consequence. And now Kip Yegon has this yellow card, which I'm sorry, these two women, they got through the prelim today, but they might be in the same semi and they're definitely going to be in the same final. Well, and the 1500 meters is going to be choppy, right? It's Space matters more choppy. than ever. And, and everybody says the 15 is, a, you know, you're getting hit left and right. It just is what it is. There's only so much space on the track, Right. And it's like fast half races. of the game, right? Yes, like, yes. Yes. Can you turn your legs over? But are you in the right spot at the right time? And to do that, it gets aggressive. And now she has to be super careful, passive, right? And that that takes away your your instinctual racing, right? right? Because you have this thinking over your head. So that's for me. That's leaving a bad taste in my mouth this morning. I don't like that at all. Well, it'll be interesting to watch if she looks different or if she's very aware of it or she's just like, ah, fuck it. I'm just going to race my race. If they give me another yellow card or if I get DQ'd because of this card. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking back, I've never really seen this before or just, I wasn't paying attention, but at the U S Olympic trials, St. Pierre got one. I can't mm -hmm. remember who she got it with in one of the rounds of the <laughs> 1500, but in the final, she just raced aggressively and she just I loved it. She just didn't right. let it bother her. I'm going to eliminate the trouble by getting yeah, out front. I'm just going to get out front and that way nobody can say anything and I'm just going to run hard. Good luck keeping up with me. But with Shakari Richardson, she had stepped on the inside of the lane in the 200 semi. And so she had a yellow card and it did affect her final. Yeah. She ran on the outside of the lane. Like, look, I'm not touching. I'm not touching right. it. And that doesn't mean she would have made the Olympic team, but it definitely affected the way she Changed ran the final. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know if I've never paid attention or if this hasn't really happened before, but it's like opening my eyes, this whole yellow card thing. I, I guess I didn't even really realize it's a thing, but it's a thing. Yeah. I feel like it's, you're usually just DQ'd. Like you stepped on the line a couple you're times. Out. DQ. So yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like that's usually what it is. I mean, in the, the pushing and the shoving, I think it's strange. I mean, yeah. it, there's a lot of things with that, with both of them not having it. But also, if you're not doubling, it wouldn't matter anyway. Like, right, right. It's like, this is a new event. This is, you know. And it's weird that the yellow card follows you for the whole Olympics. Right? Like, how do I get rid of it? Can I do ex some extra credit? Like, I'm in a new event. Can <laughs> I start from? Yeah. <laughs> Can we, like, shake hands and hug? Like, how do I get out of this thing? Can you do it a class or something? <laughs> therapy session <laughs> i will do the class yeah. i'll do driver's ed <laughs> if i can get my ticket erased the points up yeah, yeah. right <laughs> uh, very strange but is there do you want to do we're super long and i'm sorry but do you want to do any background on like the tension kenya ethiopia like it's there right it's real oh, big time. is that part of this i feel yes. like there's people who are newer to track like what why do they hate each other I, I think there, I think there's tension between the countries, and I do think there's tension between Sagai and Kip Yegon specifically. specifically. I mean, like Sagai, she she's she's a medalist at the World Championships in the 1500, right? And I think then she moved to the five. Kip Yegon wasn't there. I I mean, I'm not going to pretend to know exactly what's going on there, but but they aren't friendly. Yeah. <laughs> 
So it's it's a Ingebrigtsen in Kerr, but in the women's with less talk and more physical shifts. Yeah, yeah. more <laughs> physicality, less talking. That's exactly right. I'm okay with that. One of the things that I've always thought was so funny about Sagai is that when she races, she just looks pissed and mean. And then if you go to her Instagram, she is smiling and happy in every post where Kip Yegan comes across as a little more happy and mentorish and all this stuff. And Sagai yeah. comes across as just like, Arr. but if you go to her Instagram, she's like always smiling, hugging, like all these things. So I think it's funny to see that context because she's definitely seen as like the aggressive one. Yeah. Um, but they well, I thought it was fun to watch Faith get aggressive. Like, Me too. You know, like she was like, absolutely not. She was, her face was like, like, I mean, uh-huh. I don't know what she was saying, but I felt like she was like, are you fucking kidding me right, right now? Right. What is Swahili for fucking kidding me? <laughs> and I felt like being interested about, I was like, you guys calm down. Right. Like she was on the outside talking to him like, you guys. And, and Hassan was just watching it all happen. Like just idiot. laughing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll punch uh, Swahili into my Duolingo. Yeah, and see what they were saying. See no, but they're, the two countries, obviously, huge rivalry. And those two in particular have been racing a long time. And, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of a lot of love between them. So. Well, I think it's great. I think rivalries are great for the sport. Yeah. And we're going to see one of the best ones tonight. tonight. Yep. Men's 1500. Do you want to make any predictions or no? Uh, me- for, for me, the first lap will tell me a lot. Yeah. You know, if they're if they're 58 seconds or slower, I think you're handing it to Kerr and or Cole Hawker. If they are 57, nine and faster, I feel like that plays into a Nagus or an Ingebrigtsen. I do not see Nagus beating Ingebrigtsen, though. So then I favor Ingebrigtsen. I I don't it's so hard to say. I feel like it's going to be. Kerr, Ingebrigtsen, Hawker, but Hawker could steal the show. I just I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Any chance Nagus leads off the line like that I, semi? I, I hope so. I mean, I think that's his best chance. His best yeah. chance is to go out there and just hustle that shit. But Hawker said, I'm ready for 326, 327. I don't care. I'm going for it. So it's it's a treat for us, right? It's going to be fast. That's It has like, to be. It, it has, has to, to be. Because they want to make sure it's only them left on that final 200. Yeah. And what's your prediction? I hate making predictions, but I just made mine. And we can always change it tomorrow once we've seen it. <laughs> it's not a prediction anymore. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I'm going to go Kerr and Gibbertson Hawker. Oh, okay. We're the same. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go Kerr and Gibbertson. No, no. Hawker. That's what you said. Go with what you no. said. Kessler from way back. Oh, that'd be awesome. All right. We'll go with my heart a little bit there. Okay. I feel like you kind of fudged that a little bit, but. Yeah. Well, we can't have the exact same thing. That's ridiculous. Why? We're both smart. We're smart women. (laughs) I'll take the loss if if that happens. But, uh, you know, my first pick and my heart pick is Kessler. All right. We have to do an Olipop highlight, top one, top step moment. Okay. Give me something. I really got to – I know Mondo and Val were awesome, but I really got to give Hodgkinson the tip of the hat, the mm. way she ran. There, were, She just wanted to get that job done. Nothing flashy, no mistakes. I'm going to run a flawless race here and make sure I get the job done. That, that's my pick. What about you? Um, I'm going to go with Estad de France. I okay. think I did that more Spanish than <laughs> French, but that's okay. Um I the the stadium has been rocking. Yeah. And everyone stayed. It was like the men's 10. Everyone stayed for that world record. They were on their feet. They were doing karaoke. Um I pitched this idea. We I don't I don't think we're gonna have time to implement it, but you know those like thunder sticks? Yeah. It was like baguettes, two baguettes. <laughs> like there's it's crazy in there. It it's is so crazy fun. in there. So I'm going to give it to all the fans that are staying and giving the athletes the love that they deserve That's every good. year, not just at the right. Olympics, all the time. But the fans are crushing it. Yeah. Absolutely. Should good we, one. But we should give it to Keeley. <laughs> we'll give it Keeley in second place, Stade de France. Yeah. It could be two and three. Yeah, so yeah. There's a lot of them. There's a lot. 
There you go. All right. Okay, All right. Well, Olipop top moment. Um, hit the links in the show notes for discount codes and all the fun stuff and support the support the pod because obviously we're freaking hustling Kara mostly um, to bring you these and hope you are enjoying them thanks everyone